to the Distrust and Disparities podcast, Voices from the Margins of Healthcare. On this podcast, we will explore both current and historical cases of medical injustices within the American healthcare system. We will get into how we can overcome this systemic mistreatment, advocate for ourselves, and close the gap on poor health outcomes and disparities. I'm your host, Jasmine Moore, a registered nurse, and I am joined by my co-host and good friend, Camille White. On this week's episode, we will be discussing breast cancer and Black women. We will cover Erica Hart's pronoun she, they. We will cover their story, and she is a queer Black femme who was diagnosed with bilateral breast cancer at the age of 28. How was your week then, Jasmine? My weekend was actually really good. This weekend, it was really, really nice. It was really good weather. How about you? How was your weekend? It was nice as well. Well, let's jump into this week's episode. So this month, October, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Doing the research for this episode, you just see the statistics surrounding like Black women in breast cancer, and it's scary. It can be overwhelming in terms of then, well, we already know how the healthcare industry, especially in America, treats us. So we're already at a disadvantage there. And then you add on all these other disadvantages and it's just like, okay, well, how do we overcome this? And how do we not end up being the unfortunate members of those statistics? How do we Mm -hmm. see the other side of this? Yeah. And it was just like reading up is you see black women, you're more likely to be diagnosed at a younger age. Mm -hmm. You're also more likely to get an aggressive form of cancer. And then also if it's diagnosed later in age, you're more likely to die. And it's like you, the research showing that, you know, the mortality rate is dropping for other races, but on the other hand, it's rising among black women. So it's just like, what can we do to close this gap in disparities? And I know like, um, we'll touch on that too with, um, uh, one of the organizations that we shout out later, but it's, it, it's overwhelming and it's scary, but then it's also so important to talk about because if you don't, then you sort of stay in the dark and, you know, being oblivious is not bliss because that's how you sort of maybe end up in a situation where you're not finding out about a diagnosis until way later and, it, and it's too late. And, you know, like you were saying, we need to talk about it every month. Yeah, you know, not, not just, just October. October. Like, you know, you see the pink, you see the people wearing the hats and everything, but it needs to be talked about, especially amongst like black women mm-hmm. all the time. And even like for me, just in like my family, I know like with my mom getting like mammograms, it's always like super stressful. She's like super emotional and it's, you know, it's really hard. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you try to, I try to tell her, you know, you have to go through this. The goal is to find the cancer early, which coming out, it sounds bad because it's like you don't want to find anything. But it's also like if we have to find something, Mm -hmm. we want to catch it early. So it's always just like it's really an uncomfortable conversation. And even just like going with her, I've gone with her to like appointments and just like sitting in the office and, you know, she comes back crying and, Mm. you know, you just trying to like comfort her and be like, you know, I know it's uncomfortable and everything, but Mm -hmm. you have to do it. And it's also just like builds this like fear in me. And I'm just like, I'm getting closer to yeah. that age. Like 40 is when you can start getting mammograms. And I recommend, especially if you're a black woman, to go get a mammogram at 40 and also do yourself checks because, yeah. you know, you need to look at your breasts, know how they feel, know what they look like. So if you mm-hmm. notice any abnormalities, you can catch it early and then go to your doctor. And that's so great, though, that you've been able to be there for your mom and be like, part of her support system when it's scary and you're sort of there to hold her hand and go like I know it is but like I'm here and we're doing this and 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 it will be okay 
I encourage everybody to have these conversations with the women, your friends in your life, just to make this a normal, everyday talking point and, you know, mm-hmm. just try to support them in any way you can. And, you know, even though it's uncomfortable, it's one of the steps that we need to do to, yeah. you know, find and detect any abnormalities early. Yeah. So let's jump in. You know, we talked about the statistics and, you Mm -hmm. know, this ain't about my story. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, like, it's sort of about, like, everyone's story. And it's important if you do have, like, a personal connection, if you want to and if you can to share it. But yes, our our, um, the main story that we're highlighting today is about Erica Hart. And so um, Erica Hart is a black queer femme activist, writer and highly acclaimed speaker and award winning sexuality educator who has a master's of education in human sexuality from Widener University. And I got that directly from their website, which is I like the letter I heart Erica dot com. And I remember seeing Erica at Afropunk years ago and even talking about how like us being in shock and awe of her of seeing her. Yes. And I remember that Afropunk, you know, the days Mm -hmm. of going to Afropunk and it's like, yeah, Afropunk is such a welcoming space to be the black person you want to be. It's just, you see so many different beautiful black people just being themselves. And, Mm -hmm. you know, nobody is judging you for that. You can, it's a safe space, very inclusive. Starting at age 13 with Erica's story. So when Erica was 13, they lost their mother to breast cancer. And so that, of course, had a huge impact on her life. And just like going forward with that, because, you know, that's a devastating event. And then in May of 2014, at 28, Erica was diagnosed with it's HER2 positive and then triple negative breast cancer. So she had the diagnosis of one in each of her breasts. And she had been conducting self-breast exams since she was 13 because of her mother and eventually at 28 found a lump. And so after that diagnosis, Erica had a double mastectomy and that was literally in July 2014. She found the lump in in May, went and got tested, diagnosed, and then in July is having a double mastectomy. And then they underwent chemotherapy treatment. And I think that was for about a year after um, the double mastectomy happened. Yeah, and so that's a lot. Um, it's a lot on, I feel like, yeah, a young body where you know, society tells women we're valued based upon our looks. And then especially then the looks go into, you know, our breast and to make that huge decision too, at such a young age where you're literally transforming, you know, the body that you knew into something that like, this is for, of course, your safety and your health, but that I'm sure that's a huge mental toll on anyone. And just like in your 20s, you're accepting your body, you're you finally like, I feel like know your body and understand how it works. And then to be diagnosed with breast cancer at such a young age. And then also to know that your mom passed away from breast cancer. She Mm -hmm. had to be um, young as well. So I I could that's uh, really scary just being able to like process all that and like the treatments and everything that you need to get done. I was looking up like the triple negative breast cancer. Mm -hmm. It's just a really aggressive form of breast cancer. And there's a high incidence among black women. Like I was even looking into like some studies, some studies they have looked whether they've done genetic testing to see if there's like a family link. Mm-hmm. They did show it's a higher occurrence in black women, but then also they found that black women who don't have any, they look at like your first relative. So say like your mother, if she had breast cancer, mm-hmm. especially at a younger age, that would put you at higher risk. But then some people without those factors still had tested positive for the gene markers that indicated that they would get this type of breast cancer. But just continuing on with 
Erica's story, she is now breast cancer free and has been since her her treatment and everything um, several years ago. And then you found um, several videos on YouTube of um, Erica discussing, you know, how who she is now as an, an activist. And one that really stuck out to me was the 2017 interview she had on First Person, which I had never heard of, but it's a PBS digital studios show. And this was with host Aaron Lang. And Erica talks about how... Um, after their diagnosis and in talking with their doctor and, you know, going through the steps of, okay, I'm going to have a double mastectomy. What is that going to look like? The doctor, it took her doctor two weeks to find one photo of a black woman with a double mastectomy scars where it's just like, okay, you know, I feel like in most surgeries that are invasive like that, you want to go, okay, you're telling me you're going to do something. You're going to alter my body. Hopefully, you know, save my life. Everything will be wonderful. You want to see post-op. What will your new body look like? Mm -hmm. That that's a way of helping. I think you accept, okay, this is, you can prepare then for, you know, how you may end up looking. And in two weeks of research time, the doctor was only able to find one one photo of one woman, which I'm it. mm-hmm. it, it's like, that's mind blowing of like, I'm sorry, like that's that's it. That's all you got. And you're a doctor. So I would assume that you would have access maybe to, you know, just more than a Google search. And I think and Erica doesn't say it directly, but I think that would have played into when in. 2016 at the Afropunk Festival in Brooklyn that she decided to remove her shirt and reveal um, her breast publicly for the first time. And she specifically said that it was to end the lack of black, brown, LGBTQIA plus representations and visibility in breast cancer awareness, which is so important because, again, I think even another video that you played earlier before we started recording is that the picture of breast cancer, especially in America is of like a white woman. Who does she say? Like had, you know, three kids and lived in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. You don't see members of the queer community. You don't see black and brown bodies being at the forefront of like, this is who also has breast cancer. This is who experiences this. And I think a huge part of that maybe played in like her role, of course, of revealing at Afropunk such an inclusive place like, okay, here's what my body looks like now. Here's how I look post-double mastectomy. And then she also stated that in the moment it was to reclaim my body, but I also fell in love with my post-cancer self. And I'm sure that is just one of the most difficult things to do because even if you come out on the other side of something that could have taken your life, so much of who we are and even how we identify is tied to like how we look and how people see us. So then Mm -hmm. finding that like self love and acceptance again is so important. Yes. And I, you know, I remember seeing her in Afropunk and then there was like so much like media coverage and um, Mm -hmm. just her telling her story and why she chose to go topless at Afropunk. And then, how she got, um, she was on several covers and, you know, doing brains and just telling her story. And it, I feel like for me, it made me think hearing her story, she's so young and being diagnosed with breast cancer is like, I really need to take seriously, you know, my doing like my monthly self exams and, you know, mm-hmm. making sure I get my regular checkups and do what I need to do to detect breast cancer. And also just, I thought just so brave because it's like, like I was telling with like my mom and my family, you know, you just so like depressed and sad and you almost think like having breast cancer, the end of the world, but it doesn't have to be like um, Mm -hmm. she was able to detect changes. So she went to our doctor, notified it, notified them, got the test done so that they could detect it early and that. Um, she opted to have, you know, a double mastectomy and to go through the treatments. So it's like if you we have to do our part, advocate for ourselves, you know, get mm-hmm. to know our bodies and just be comfortable with notifying any changes and just taking those steps to get a mammogram. 
if you have to get a mastectomy, you see other people speaking out, you know, you sharing their stories of what they went through and that you can be bold. You can be confident. You know, you don't have to hide yourself. You know, this is no. just one part of you, but you are more than, you know, just a body part. Yeah, <laughs> completely more. Unfortunately, society doesn't see women in that way. It's usually, you know, pussy and titties, but that's it. But <laughs> <You're right. laughs> we are so much more than that. We are so right. much. And then that also, that also, again, is very heteronormative and specific to if you identify as one specific gender. And they're usually only calling out women who are cisgendered. And it's that's very exclusive and just a terrible way to think. Um, and then it's also on the other side of just if you end up having to have a double mastectomy and Erica is able to be out there, you know, loud and proud of their body and who they are in that way, while others may choose to, you know, decide to get um, breast implants afterwards. And if that's what you feel like you need to do in order to move past, you know, that feeling of like, oh, I don't feel as myself. Hopefully it's born out of more so the body that you were comfortable with before you would maybe want to try to reclaim that in some way. Do that for you. It's just so great that she was so brave, like you said, to reclaim her body and show the world like this is me and then continues to do so with her platform. And then it's all about her goal is to dismantle anti-blackness in our community that like our community faces every day. And of course, especially in healthcare. It's so great that she's such a visible figure for breast cancer. Here is Erica. Here is someone that, you know, looks like me, looks like my family members. And it's all about, like you said, early detection. Should you face it? So then you can come out on the other side like they have. And like she said, representing herself and just increasing visibility of Black women and also queer women. Just putting that out there. And then it's, it just opens the door for conversation. So I would say opens the door conversation for like Black women. Like she was diagnosed so young. So it's like we need to, um, like I was saying, do our breast exams and, you know, advocate for ourselves to get our mammograms done at 40 and, you know, follow up just to make sure if we notice anything abnormality. And then if you're not cisgendered, you know, you don't think about, um, she was saying in her interviews, you know, it was uncomfortable conversations, you know, the doctor having these conversations just about like her sex life. Most of the information is probably for cisgendered women, but if mm-hmm. you don't identify as what society considers normal, you're there's a, like a lack of information. So just having this conversation, having, you know, breast cancer be inclusive because even, you know, just talking about even men getting diagnosed yeah. with like breast cancer and everything. And also she was talking about um, just like her sex drive dropped when, you know, she was going through treatments and everything and they... It's like a taboo and like her background is in sex education. So it's like, you know, this is really important conversations that need to be had. Like you're um, going through this, you know, when you got cancer and then also you have to have, you know, if you opt for like a mastectomy, you know, you're removing like a part of yourself. So it's just like also, you know, being comfortable in your body. And then also if you have a partner, you know, talking with them about what you're going through. So Mm -hmm. I would say she just opened the door just to have these conversations that probably, you know, you might have been just maybe having, you know, maybe between like you and your partner or maybe not even having it. So you know, now you can talk about it. You can see articles, you know, more information to look it up that you can mm-hmm. look into. Yeah. Which is just, yeah, the the talking and communication. And that's that's one of the biggest parts of it. And I would say definitely I was watching a lot of her videos on YouTube. Mm-hmm. She um, she's just a very powerful speaker. Mm hmm. And just about like inclusivity as like a black woman um, representing the LGBTQIA plus community Mm -hmm. and just like you said, in healthcare, the visibility, but even in just like every day life, one of the um, interviews, it was like, 
when, you know, white women get diagnosed, it's like, oh, this is crazy. We feel bad. But if it's like black women, she was saying black women get diagnosed. It's like, oh, they be all right. They got it. Like they're strong, Mm -hmm. like the strong black women trope. Like it's okay. Like they going to, they'll be fine. they'll, They'll persevere. They always make it through any and everything, which is, yeah, it immediately sort of makes me think of like, oh, black people feel pain differently. Like that sort of bullshit. Uh, Mm -hmm. where like at times you want to go like we're basically special magical creatures that never feel any pain where like that all stems back to slavery and why we were enslaved because it was just like oh no y'all don't really feel anything and so yeah that's Mm -hmm. then why it's easy for so many organizations who are claiming to be there for people experiencing breast cancer, you're there for a particular type of person. And it, and it's definitely not a black woman who's on the forefront on like your homepage in advertisements of like, you need to go get checked out. You need to talk to your family members. It's they, they have someone else as their spokesmodel. And that's a huge problem. And Erica being so visible and, out there and doing so many interviews and things um, is is so important for us and for our community. True. And also when I was doing research, just looking like, why is this gap so large? And even, you know, black women. So we're more likely to die of breast cancer. So why is that? And it was just like, some articles and studies, they just went into the barriers Mm -hmm. of like treatment. And one of them was like delays in treatments. And then also some, some, something as simple as like transportation. So delay issues, it could be like, um, finding the right doctor. So some of the articles go back and we'll cover more in future episodes, just like, of like redlining, to get to the best hospital for breast cancer or even like maybe these oncology centers, they may be far from where you're living at. Mm -hmm. So you might have to travel far. So that is a, a, like I was saying, like transportation and getting to your appointments. It's a lot more hoops you have to go to. And also Mm -hmm. if you don't have access to a vehicle and with like the delays in treatments, maybe like finding the right doctor um, or even if you're going to your community hospital, maybe there is, I know one study was saying they didn't have like specifically trained mammogram um, radiologists or technicians to help oh. detect the breast cancer. So you might be, um, it might be detected later or you might have to go through like getting like a n- several follow-ups before you mm. can like start your treatment. Mm -hmm. And then also, I know the foundation that we're going to mention, Black Women, you're the the one that holds the family together. So it's not like you're going through treatments and a lot of people are dependent on you and things that you have to do. So you might not have nobody that can pick up your kids if you're a single mother. Like who Mm -hmm. is there that can help like pick up your kids and do stuff like that for you? Like yeah. who are your, you know, your support system, you like your resources and stuff like that. Well, another one that comes to mind is that I remember learning the statistic that of like clinical trials when it comes mm-hmm. to breast cancer, that black women make up 3% of the participants. And That's it's just like, crazy. Um, <laughs> it's insane. Where it's just like, I'm sorry, but right. we need more black women in those trials and it was like a number of things that kept that from happening be it their doctors not recommending them to participate Mm -hmm. in trials or i mean the whole reason why we we started the podcast i wanted to talk about things of like our distrust of the healthcare industry so you don't want to sign up where you feel like you're going to be some sort of guinea pig and it's dismantling that you know one of your favorite words and getting people (laughs) to understand where it's just like, okay, here's a safe place where you can go. Here's a clinical trial that it's important that we're a part of them because if things aren't studied on us, then they don't know how it will truly affect us. And therefore I think that does add into why we are having different outcomes than others. They don't know truly how it differs in black women. And then we're sort of left out of the conversation And at only 3% of participation, like, yeah, we're not getting enough eyes 
on members of our community to see, okay, like, is this truly working for them? How can we change things? Uh, what, what else needs to happen to make sure that any medication, any treatment that is being produced will truly help everyone, not just the, the majority of people who are in those studies? Yes, definitely. 3%, that is so low. We definitely need to figure out ways to increase, you know, Black women participating in these studies. Black women, you know, knowing about these studies and, Mm -hmm. you know, feeling comfortable to participate in these studies because there could be like some biological differences that, you know, different treatment modalities could help to target that might be different from Black women and other, other races. You know, mm-hmm. that could be a, a key component. And, yeah. you know, until that happens, you know, what we need to do, you know, we need to make sure I'm going to keep saying it this whole episode. You <laughs> look at your breasts, get yes. comfortable with how they look, you know, yes. feel them. I know, you know, do your monthly self-exam, especially because you can be diagnosed under 40 and Mm -hmm. you know the standard is for you to get your mammogram done at 40 so start doing your monthly self-exams if you're still having a period they recommend doing your um, monthly exams after your period if you are postmenopausal then you can like just pick a day on the calendar and just do it that day and then Mm -hmm. once you turn 40 you know contact your OBGYN or your primary care doctor and go get your mammogram done. Like, I know it's uncomfortable, but just do it. So if something is found, you can, we can find it early. And, yeah. you know, you have a better treatment chance. process. Yeah, you have a better chance of survival and a better chance at, yeah, finding it early where maybe the measures to um, make you better are as invasive as the point of, like, having um, a mastectomy at all. Yes. And, you know, this podcast, we're all about advocating for ourselves and, you know, dismantling (laughs) systems of oppression. (laughs) But the first step of advocating for ourselves is going to be to, you know, check our breasts, talk to your friends, talk to the women in your life about checking their breasts, making sure they get their mammograms. And also, like, say you're in a situation where, you know, you think something is off and you're not getting the best care you know, talk to your doctor about getting a second opinion, um, Mm -hmm. getting another follow-up. Say your hospital that's close to you in your community is not the best, or you want to go to like a specialist, you know, looking into like your insurance and what they'll cover. And if you don't have insurance, you know, we're going to mention some like resources and like websites that you can do, you know, just looking for resources where you can go to get free mammograms, free testing done as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess this would be a good transition into our um, dismantling distrust and disparities organizations. So I know the one of them that we found that we thought was a good one was Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance. And it's an advocacy organization that was founded by Ricky Farley, who is a triple negative breast cancer survivor. And so the mission statement on Touch is that um, they drive the collaborative efforts of patients, survivors, advocates and advocacy organizations, healthcare professionals, researchers and pharmaceutical companies to work collectively with accountability towards the common goal of eradicating black breast cancer. Yes. And we selected her organization because I was looking up information about triple negative breast cancer and her story came up about how she had triple negative breast cancer um, and she went through the treatment process and she is a survivor. So she created this organization um, because she recognized that there is significant barriers that black women may face to detecting breast cancer and also treatment. So Mm -hmm. her goal was to, you know, form an alliance with other survivors, patients, other organizations, healthcare professionals, and researchers, just so you can have information out there 
and you know yeah. you can where you can go to to get information and like she said recognizing like the unique challenges that black women face and also the lack of participation in clinical trials that three mm-hmm. percent he is really you know trying to work on increasing um black women's participation in clinical studies yeah she even started the hashtag of black data matters and then with that is having you know really important conversations with other breast cancer survivors and doctors about how do we go about changing that statistic of such a low participation rate and then even Ricky herself along with Dr. Monique Gary hosts a weekly web series on blackdoctor.org on Facebook Live and they're and they're having conversations with, you know, members of the community of black community that are in those positions where it's just like, what can we do? How can we have it where more of us are participating? Because our data does matter. We need to be incorporated into how things are being thought about and researched and then what comes out of those. So the treatments work for us. Participating in clinical trials, that definitely needs to be increased. So that's a huge, something huge to tackle to try yeah. to change and get more participation. And like I said, I've gone to her social media, her Facebook and her Instagram. I'm definitely going to check out the Facebook live series that she has every Wednesdays because these conversations need to be had outside mm-hmm. of October. They need to be taking place all the time. So just getting different perspectives. Um, I saw she's, you know, talking to several doctors, I think mm-hmm. on the upcoming one, like a black oncologist yeah, and, you know, black women working in breast cancer research. Mm-hmm. And also, um, I think on one of them, she was like, she interviewed Jasmine Sullivan. I know her mom, she's been talking about like her mom and um, going through breast cancer with her mom. Okay. And just like dealing with a parent who is diagnosed with breast cancer and, you know, going mm-hmm. through that. Yeah. Check out Touch, the Black Breast Cancer Alliance, and you can go to their website. It's touchbbca.org. And then there you can find links to the Facebook Live that we're talking about that she hosts, along with if you would like to donate to their cause too on their website. Yes, donate and support organization working to dismantle and close this gap. Participate, engage on their social media. Mm -hmm. Um, They have plenty of free resources that you can check out just so you can learn more about breast cancer. And then additionally, um, when I was looking up stuff and went to Erica Hart's Twitter, something really important that they posted on October 1st, of course, because it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, is that Erica encourages people to contribute directly to breast cancer survivors. And not just, you know, like we said, not just in the month of October, but throughout the year, Mm -hmm. because a lot of nonprofits and charities raising funds for cancer research, that aid rarely goes directly to survivors. So it's also important there if you know someone and can, and and that's another way in terms of just providing it directly to someone who needs it instead of sometimes going through like the bigger organizations. Cause that's why we're, you know, particularly shouting out touch. If you can donate directly to black women who are breast cancer patients and survivors. And if not touch is a great organization to look to and, and find a way to participate and help people that way as well. Yes, let's keep our coins going to who needs it most and Mm -hmm. who is, you know, who it will impact the most. And, you know, what I'm trying to say, let's go directly to the source. Yes, (laughs) let's do that. Let's go directly (laughs) to the source and donate. And, you know, if you got somebody in your family, you know, going through treatments, you know, help them out, share this information, Mm -hmm. share this episode with all the black women all the sisters in your life yes because it's it's so important to talk about thanks for listening to this week's episode we hope erica's story demonstrates the importance of checking in with your body and the importance of visibility and representation of black people in medicine
Also, after today's episode, take time to check your own breasts and ask your friends, loved ones, anybody in your life, when's the last time they checked their breasts or had a mammogram. If you notice any changes in your breasts, such as a new lump or skin changes, consult with your doctor. Also, ask your doctor when you should begin getting mammograms or any other additional screenings based on your personal and family history. And if you would like to share your personal story to help bring awareness to breast cancer, please email us at distrustanddisparities at gmail.com. Or if you would like to shout out a great organization working with black breast cancer patients and survivors. And also don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. 